Okay, so the so, um, last lecture of today is by Steve Kibbelson from Stanford. And um, he's going to tell us about um, electron phonon coupling theories. Let's welcome him. There, that's that, good. Um, right, so um, I'm going to talk about an old problem. Uh, and since most of the people here are at old, I'll start <laughs> by um, uh, today I will tell you old things, uh, which are the context and uh, the nominal solution of this problem. And then in my lecture tomorrow, I'll tell you about some new progress we've made uh, in which we've, I hope, managed to sow confusion. Um, so uh, the electron phonon problem is something that's laid dormant for a long time. Uh, I, early in my career, I mentioned phonons once and got kicked out of the RVB tent for my <laughs> offense. Um, but phonons are extremely important, and electron phonon coupling determines many of the properties of solids that we know about and care about. It determines the resistivity of most uh, crystalline metals, and the mobilities of uh, semiconductors at most uh, uh, interesting ranges of temperatures, uh, and of course, uh, determines TC in what we call conventional uh, superconductors. Uh, relevant to uh, things that maybe are more interesting to people nowadays, it's why many body localization probably can't happen in solids. Uh, it's why Floquet problems are problematic in solids. Uh, it's why chaos in mixing are mostly irrelevant to uh, thermalization in solids, because all of these things occur through the electron phonon coupling, through couplings to external heat baths. And uh, so, um, good. So what's the electron phonon problem? So, uh, so there's some parameters in the problem. By the way, feel free to interrupt with questions. So there's the phonon dispersions. Which I'll call omega of k. There's the ion mass, which is a uh, separate parameter, that is to say, omega k squared is equal to some stiffness, which tells us the restoring force for the atomic motions divided by the ion mass. The ion mass is the one really, one over the ion mass is one, the one really small parameter that's actually small in solid, so I'm uh, picking it out separately. There is an electron phonon coupling. Alpha of k. So for instance, the if xq is the is a phonon displacement where you transform <coughs> wave vector q, then the electron phonon uh, coupling alpha of q tells us how much scattering that produces, scattering electrons from the state k to a state k plus q. And uh, I'll abstract from these an, a sort of average phonon frequency. And uh, let's see, a average 
electron phonon coupling constant, which will be in units of energy. So it's some average of alpha squared over k. So this has units of energy. And in particular, from that, one defines the dimensionless electron phonon coupling, omega f omega, uh, the density of states at the Fermi surface times g. So that's a dimensionless, that's the conventional dimensionless measure <coughs> of the strength of the electron phonon coupling. Um, and uh, I'll define w to be the dimensionless version of the typical phonon frequency. So those are, those are the parameters we're going to be dealing with in the problem at hand. Um, now, uh, the electron phonon interaction is a nonlinear term, so it's an interaction, and so one is tempted often to write down perturbative expressions in powers of lambda. Uh, conceptually, we can certainly think about a electron system weakly coupled to a phonon system. In fact, in order to talk about electrons and phonons, we sort of implicitly have in mind that they're weakly coupled to each other. But in fact, in real solids, there's no small parameter. Lambda is always of order one. Um, uh, we, uh, as I mentioned, we ignore it in the coup rates because we're told to, but actually, Mueller's thinking when he discovered the cuprate high temperature superconductors was that these would be materials that have particularly strong electron phonon coupling. And indeed, the electron phonon coupling is very strong. That doesn't mean one shouldn't ignore it. But uh, it's not ignorable because the electron phonon coupling is small. Um, so in particular, in terms of powers of the mass, the electron phonon coupling is of order the ion mass to the zero power. However, the dimensionless phonon frequency is of order the ion mass to the minus one half power. So this is really a genuine small parameter. And if we could learn to use this small parameter, uh, then we would not only be doing something that's interesting theoretical physics, but we might be able to have something to say about real materials. Uh, just as an aside, uh, it's not always true that this is small. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, doped C60 is an interesting problem. And there, the intramolecular phonons are comparable to the intermolecular bandwidths. Uh, twisted bilayer graphene is currently very topical. There, the phonon frequencies are large compared to at least the flat band bandwidth near the Fermi energy. Uh, strontium titanate uh, has been found to be metallic and superconducting down to such low electron densities that the Fermi energy is small compared to the phonon frequency. So there are interesting problems in electron phonon space where even this small parameter doesn't exist. But I'm, I'm going to ignore those. I'm interested in problems of good metals where uh, this phonon frequency is small. And so now we encounter uh, Migdal's theorem. You know, um, I worked for a while with mathematical physicists. And so I now have a very hard time saying the word theorem about almost anything. I mean, <laughs> theorems are things that we really believe are true. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, there's no theorem here. But there's a very compelling uh, set of arguments that go under the name of Migdal's theorem. And uh, what Migdal's theorem showed us how to do, and what I'm going to describe in some detail, is how to use, um, how to resum perturbation theory so that it's valid even if lambda isn't small, 
so long as the Bigal tells us how to solve the problem in principle, so long as lambda times the dimensionless phonon frequency is much less than 1, which in particular means that as long as the electron phonon coupling is small compared to 1 over the typical phonon frequency. So it could be arbitrarily large compared to 1, providing that there is sufficient retardation. And I'm only going to be talking about this today in the context of the electron phonon problem, but this same sort of reasoning underlies many effective field theory uh, calculations that are done, for instance, in quantum critical phenomena in metals and in various other places. So there are implications of the discussion here. So here I wrote up some references. This is what I'm going for. So first place, uh, Migdal, uh, Migdal wrote his theorem 60 years ago. So this is literally a problem that was solved, or at least declared solved, 60 years ago. And there are many beautiful places you can read about it, but at least for me, the clearest is an article by Doug Scalapino in a famous book called Superconductivity, which was edited by Parks. Um, and then tomorrow, I'll talk about the content of two recent papers, actually both in collaboration with Doug Scalapino, one called Break Breakdown of Miguel the Ashberg Theory, uh, Determinantal Quantum Monte Carlo Study, which appears in Fisra B, and another called The Bound on Superconducting TC, which appears on the archive. Uh, so, um, good. So, what is Migdal's theorem? So, Migdal looked at the perturbative expression for the electron propagator and the, uh, the phonon propagator. For instance, if we look at the perturbation theory for the electron propagator, there is an unperturbed line, which, as usual, we just draw with a line with an arrow. And then there's a lowest order term where one phonon line is exchanged. And then in the second order, there's a bunch of terms. There's a term like this. And there's a term like this. And there's a term like this. And then there's a term like this. So this term is of order lambda. These terms are all of order lambda squared. And this term turns out to be small. So this term is of order lambda, lambda squared, lambda squared, lambda squared. But this is of order lambda squared times w. This is called the vertex correction. Um, so uh, I. Uh, more or less have always confused about what a vertex correction is. The only definition I know that's standard is that vertex correction is the difference between the right answer and the answer you calculated. <laughs> um, uh, but here, what it really means is diagrams that have a topology where you have a vertex in which the phonon is coming in and the two, sorry, electron lines are coming out and then a phonon line goes across here. So anytime you see a piece of a diagram that looks like that, it's got a vertex correction. So none of these diagrams have any pictures that look like that, but here what you can see is that if I look at this as being this piece, and this 
as being that piece, this is a vertex correction. Um, and showing that these vertex corrections are small is actually somewhat subtle. It depends on kinematics. It's not universally true. It doesn't work so well in one dimension. Uh, I'm not going to spend time doing integrals. You really have to spend a lot of time staring at integrals to do it. But this is a completely correct statement. So, um, so um, and similarly for the uh, phonon propagator, we have you know, terms that look like this, but then we have terms that look like this, and we have terms that look like this, but then we have terms that look like this, which we're going to throw out. All right, so everybody happy with this? So if we throw out these vertex corrections, it turns out that we can rewrite the entire perturbative series in terms of closed self-consistent equations. What you can see is that this is a self-energy term. This is a higher order term in the self-energy, which is just self-consistently generated if I had a full propagator here. This is just a self-energy term for the phonon propagator. This is just the geometric series that tells us that it's a self-energy. So in the end, if we are diligent, we find that D, which we'll write as a double line like this, is equal to a single line, the bare vertex, because we're told we're supposed to not have any bare vertex corrections, the renormalized electron propagator, and then a renormalized phonon line, uh, and plus. And the G is equal to this plus this. Yeah, you just have a typo in your top one. It should be a single script. That single script there, yes, thank you. And this we can write as integral equations. And so this tells me that d is equal to 1 over d inverse uh, minus pi. And that g is equal to 1 over g naught inverse minus sigma. And that sigma of k to the integral is equal to al equal alpha squared of q integral d q over 2 pi to the b times g of k plus q d of q and that pi of q is equal to the integral d k over 2 pi to the d alpha of q squared g of k squared. OK, and so you can see these are complicated equations. In order to calculate g and d, I have to know what sigma and pi are. But they are just some set of integral equations which we can iterate. Yes? So here we are not neglecting any orders of lambda, right? This is to all orders of lambda. I'm just throwing out all vertex corrections. So nominally, this is valid up to corrections that are small as long as lambda times w is small. OK? So 
This is Migdal theory. It becomes migdal the ashberg theory, which for I'm not going to actually use, but just so you know where the Eli Ashberg and Migdal Eli Ashberg is, if I allow the electron green function to have an anomalous piece, that is to say, if I try to write down the same equations in the superconducting state, it has exactly the same form as this. Sorry, Steve. Yeah. The g squared probably should be g of k, g of k plus q. It's g of k, g of k plus q. Thank you. And trace. What? Trace of this also. Well, I've just got one, one electron and one phonon. But yes, if I add multiple, multiple bands and multiple phonon modes, there would be indices as well. What? Just for the spin. Anyways. The spins, yeah, they probably should have put two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Um, and then there's similar, uh, uh, this allows me to calculate the electron propagator and the phonon propagator. If I wanted to calculate, for instance, the superconducting susceptibility, I would put in uh, external sources for an electron pair and a uh, electron pair sink. And I would have the bare susceptibility, but then we would also sum up uh, all of the non-vertex diagrams, which is all the diagrams where there are phonon propagators going across this way. So this is for chi superconductivity. And for CDW, we would sum up all the RPA-like diagrams. Whoops, better end. Okay, so there's a very explicit set of prescriptions of how to calculate any of the quantities that you want. And so, um, all right, so that's, that's Migdal or migdal eli ashberg theory. Um, now, so, what I'm really interested in is, is this right? And what do we learn from it? And what are the dangers of it? But if you look at the literature, there's, there's two things that get, several things that get uh, confused with this, would make it a little bit harder to understand. So one is that, you know, nowadays we have big computers, things, equations like this don't really scare us. You get a set of equations like that, you you plug it into the computer, or actually it's a two-step process. You plug it into a graduate student. A graduate student. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, you, you, know, you just solve the problem. You don't go on talking. Once you've got these equations, you say, and this is the answer. Uh, but you know, this is 60 years ago we we're talking about. People still use slide rules. And so um, there's lots of literature about how to solve these things, and, and a lot of look, insight comes into it. And there are a number of things that, uh, that are in these things, both of which have certain validity. But, but um, OK, so for instance, one thing is it's often observed that the k-dependence of the electron self-energy is relatively unimportant, that it's only the frequency dependence that's important. And so people often simplify the solution of this problem by ignoring the k-dependence of the self-energy. Um, more importantly for some of the discussion that I'm going to have later is that often people don't actually solve for the phonon propagator self-consistently at all. They take, say, rather, let's just take the phonon propagator from experiment. We'll let. Uh, the uh, quantum mechanics of real materials solve the self-consistency equations for us 
for the phonon propagator, and then we just have to solve the, um, the self-consistency equation uh, for the electron self-energy. And in fact, since usually phonons don't do all that much that's interesting, uh, one often doesn't even do that, but just take some estimate, maybe from band structure or something, of the phonon propagator, and again, doesn't bother do anything self-consistent. Can you say a word about uh, how much information is needed from the experiment, and what kinds of experiments provided that important information to you? Um, so, uh, so usually, um, so usually, you know, we're thinking about optical phonon modes. So the Q dependence of D isn't very important. So one talks about something called alpha squared f of omega, which is actually the integral of some appropriate integral of alpha squared times D with uh, the proper values of 1 over omegas and so on included. And so that's just one frequency dependent function, which can be, in fact, extracted from tunneling data. Um, but more generally, you can extract data about D from neutron scattering. And OK, that depends on how much structure there is in the neutron scattering data, how strongly those things are coupled. So there's not a universal answer. I mean, Phonons usually don't have a lot of k-space structure, and that's something that makes it easier than the corresponding problem that people try to do, for instance, in high temperature superconductivity, where the k-dependence of the magnetic response is, is important in some way or other. Um, yeah? Is there another question? OK. Um, so, uh, so good, where am I? Ah, yes. But so there are a couple of things that I want to comment about. So, um, so uh, there was a question that arose, which was once we adopt the Ashberg theory, then we have a theory of, well, among other things, the superconducting susceptibility. So we can ask, when does it diverge? And so we can have a theory that should be able to predict superconductors, or at least tell us something about where to look for good superconductors. And there was a question about whether it was always better to have stronger electron-phonon coupling. There was a very famous analysis done in 1975, I think, by Allen and Dines, where they looked at, at this theory. They as I uh, suggested, they did not worry about the self-consistency of D. Uh, and they came to the conclusion that if lambda is much bigger than 1, which, remember, uh, Migdal tells us is perfectly legitimate territory to think about, that PC grows without bound. It grows like the phonon frequency times the square root of lambda. OK? So that's an exciting result. It tells us all we have to do is keep finding bigger and bigger electron phonon couplings. And we can get PCs that are high. We can get PCs that are even higher than the phonon frequencies. Um, now, uh, of course, there are troubles with very strong electron-phonon couplings. You might have uh, some sort of other instability. But as long as you could avoid uh, other instabilities, say, put steel rods between the atoms to keep them from collapsing or going into a charge density wave, then the root to high PC is to get very strong electron phonon coupling. Now, more recently, within Eliashberg theory, it's been realized that that's a little bit optimistic 
because what inevitably happens is as you turn up the strong electron phonon coupling is that you get some phonon softening. And in some general sense, the phonon frequency goes like some bare phonon frequency divided by the square root of 1 plus <coughs> lambda. And so if I plug that in here, this would tell me that this would asymptote at large lambda to something like omega naught. So it still tells you that you gain by turning up the electron phonon coupling. The bigger lambda, the better TC is. But the bare phonon frequency, or some number times the bare phonon frequency, uh, provides you a bound on TC. So it, it, do, it doesn't have any change in terms of wanting to find large lambdas, but it does tell you that you're not going to go on way up above phonon frequencies. Um, OK. Um, and of course, this is what happens for large lambda. For small lambda, <coughs> of course, we have the familiar BCS expression that TC gets exponentially small. So there's no question that small lambda is a bad thing for high TC. Um, right, OK. Um, I've ignored Coulomb interaction in this discussion. There are strong electron-electron interactions between electrons. And so uh, even if Migdal, the Ashberg theory, solves the electron phonon problem, you might question why it is that I think I can nonetheless compare the results to experiment. And here the answer, there's a traditional answer. And the answer is sort of paradoxical, but is in many senses right, which is that the point is that the Coulomb interactions are so strong that they can always be ignored. And you know, look, that sounds silly at first, but think about the really strong interactions you know about, which are the strong interactions. And you know, how much attention do you pay to them in solids? Nothing, because they're so strong that they screen themselves. And in any energies that we're interested in, they're gone. And so the same argument is made about Coulomb interactions in solids, that as long as you're at energies below the plasma frequency, that all Coulomb interactions are screened out. All of the quantities that we're dealing with are effectively neutral objects. There's a theoretical construct that implements this. I, I have my own personal uh, uh, anxieties about it. But at least at the storytelling level, it's certainly correct that, uh, that the long-range Coulomb interactions, the really strong Coulomb interactions that you might worry about are, are missing because we're at energies below the plasma frequency. So that's the first step. There's screening. Uh, that still leaves some short-range repulsions between electrons, which uh, one typically uh, refers to with the dimensionless strength of the electron, electron repulsion mu. But then this is further reduced due to the effect of retardation. So if we are looking at energies Uh, much less than the Fermi energy, then mu gets replaced by a mu star. And mu star is mu over 1 plus mu times log of E Fermi 
over omega naught. Okay, so this is a familiar result, I hope, for everybody. It's actually just the mirror of the Cooper instability. So this is really just doing the Cooper calculation uh, for the susceptibility or the one loop RG calculation for the susceptibility in a more modern language. If mu were negative, then this thing diverges at the usual BCS instability. If mu is positive, then this renormalizes down to zero. And since we're going to be interested in frequencies on the order of phonon frequencies here, even though this is only a log, it's a big number. And so mu star is going to be 1 over this log, and so small, and so we can ignore it. All right, at least that's the traditional, uh, the traditional um, uh, argument. You know, uh, it seems to work in metals. We all, for the last n decades, have been studying things called highly correlated electron systems, where presumably this doesn't work. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not prepared to defend this set of statements with my life, but at least this is the rationale for ignoring electron-electron interactions when we're looking at the properties of good metals. All right, so with that aside, then let's ask how well do we learn things from this migdal ashberg theory? Uh, is it correct? And so, um, so it's interesting to go to this paper of Alan and Dines, uh, where they have big tables uh, of materials that had substantial superconducting TCs at the time. And so you have the, well, they've got lots of parameters. But for my purposes, the interesting parameters are they have the name of the material, they have the TCs, and the TCs range from a few Kelvin up to 15 or 20 Kelvin. Uh, and they have the value of lambda. Now, the value of lambda is measured. It's measured from tunneling experiments. So there's tomorrow when I talk about uh, model calculations, there's a difference we have to make between the bare lambda, that is to say, taking the electron phonon coupling defined at the microscopic scale in our model, and some normalized lambda, which is what you would measure at low frequencies. But uh, I'll get to that later. At any rate, this is a measured lambda. And one thing that's striking is if you look at their table, that all the lambdas are between 1 and 2. Now, it's pretty clear why there aren't any lambdas that are significantly less than 1. If lambda is significantly less than 1, then TC is too small to count. But if it were really true that TCs always a monotonically increasing function of lambda. And after all, by then, people already had thousands of superconductors. Why did one ever find any lambdas bigger than two? Uh, and if you look at the, uh, I think the uh, uh, record old time high temperature superconductors were you know, the A15s, niobium, three, germanium and things like that, you find lambdas like 1.75. So if it were really true that TC is a monotonically increasing function of lambda, how come nobody found any lambdas bigger than 2? OK, so maybe, maybe it always leads to instabilities, to other instabilities, but it's not obvious why there should be a general bound on lambda, certainly we could add structural features to the material that could stabilize things. At any rate, although the A15s show evidence of being close to some sort of structural instability, many of these other superconductors show no signs of being close to a structural instability. Um, all right, so 
that's uh, that's that. What about hydrogen under pressure? You mean uh, uh, H uh, um, H3S? Right. I'll get the H3S tomorrow. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good. Um, <coughs> all right, so. This is not a perturbative weak coupling theory, but nonetheless, it has a structure of a weak coupling theory. So to contrast it, uh, let's ask what happens to the electron phonon coupling, the electron phonon problem, if the electron phonon coupling is really large. What is the strong coupling limit of this problem? Okay, so now I'm going to be a little bit more explicit because I imagine that this is a little more unfamiliar. <laughs> Where are we going? <laughs> so H is going to write H in two pieces. So here's the band structure of my electrons, and here's everything else. And my strong coupling strategy is going to be that everything else is much more important than the electron band structure. So H0, uh, I'm going to have one phonon band and one electron band because I'm writing on the board, but that's not essential to anything that I'm saying. So here, we're going to have the ion kinetic energy and some set of stiffness constants. Ni is the density of electrons on site i. So I guess ni is sum over sigma. There, I, I won't forget about spin. Uh, <laughs> ci sigma, ci sigma. Uh, k is presumably a function of ri minus rj. So is alpha. Um, the phonon dispersion is the, the bare phonon dispersion, maybe not, is the Fourier transform of this over M. Okay, so this is all nice and familiar. Uh, I can write this using matrix notation to make my life easier. So what y is, which I can write down, see, y is equal to minus k inverse alpha n. y is what the equilibrium position is 
of the phonon coordinates once I told you what all the site occupancies are. And so that just shifts the, uh, the, um, the origin of vibration. So once I told you n, I told you where the phonons want to vibrate. I can then define a new phonon coordinate, which is shifted. So this part of the Hamiltonian just becomes free phonons. And I've generated some new effective interaction between the electrons, where V is equal to alpha transpose K inverse alpha. OK, and so once I've done that, the electrons and the phonons are decoupled from each other. And I've completely solved the problem. The problem, the eigenstates of this problem are direct product states of phonon eigenstates, which are diagonalizing this Hamiltonian, and some set of occupancies whose energy is just determined by this classical interaction energy. Um, there's a sort of cool formal trick for diagonalizing this Hamiltonian. We define a unitary operation, which is just a translation of the phonon modes, P to the I, sum over J, PJ, uh, where's my unitary transformation, uh, YJ, where YJ, of course, is a function of all of the occupancies of all the sites. That's written over here. And now U dagger H naught U is simply equal to free bosons minus. So U is a transformation into uh, polaronic coordinates. And so in particular, We're going to have a new creation operator. Uh, let's call this, this is C. This is A, J, sigma. This creates a dressed particle on site J. This dressed particle is an electron plus whatever polarization of the lattice it would prefer. And this is equal to C, J, sigma times e to the i sum over j pj uh, pi zij, where zij is equal to k inverse alpha. All right, so this is all trivial math. But it's physically very important. We've got totally new variables here. These variables are no longer electrons. They're electrons plus a very extreme uh, polarization cloud of phonons. I guess I wanted to. Uh, let me, this was fairly abstract, so let me consider a concrete example, which is the concrete example I'm going to be considering tomorrow, 
which is the Holstein model. So the Holstein model is the most local version of this possible. So it's Kij is equal to delta Ij times K. I just have an Einstein oscillator on every site. And alpha Ij, the coupling of the displacements of the ions on a site is the same, uh, is only to the density on that site. And then this Zij is equal to delta Ij times alpha over k. So if the site, if I add an electron to the site, I simply distort the phonon mode on that site by an amount alpha over k. Um, and then in this case, V i j is of course equal to delta i j times v, where v is equal to alpha squared over k. So this model that I've generated is a negative u Hubbard model. Well, I called it v. So a negative v Hubbard model. So its ground state, in fact, all of its low energy states will be put two electrons on some sites, put no electrons on the other sites. At this strong coupling level, I don't care how you arrange them. If I included some farther range terms in this, then there would be some interactions between these sites. So this is a problem that's described by a set of bipolarons. Bipolarons are these doubly charged things. They, if I went beyond this, they would interact in some way. But it's a classical problem. It's a classical problem of bipolarons, as long as I'm at temperatures low compared to be. OK, which means that there'll be disordered phases. There'll be charge density wave phases. There might be phase separation. But there's no metal, and there's no superconductor the strong coupling limit of this problem is totally different physics. They're interesting dressed particles, but they're really classical. Uh, OK, so that's the strong coupling limit. Let's ask, how strong does the electron phonon coupling have to be before we think that the strong coupling limit is valid? So let's ask it the way we did about Eli Ashberg theory. Let's start with the strong coupling limit, and let's calculate corrections to it. So in order to calculate corrections to it, we have to do perturbation theory in powers of u dagger h band u. OK, and so there are two sorts of terms that we generate. So one is, well, if I happen to have a bipolaron on this site and nothing on that site, then in second order perturbation theory, I can hop one electron to the neighboring site, which costs me an energy V because I've broken my pair, but then I hop it back in second order. So this will give me a renormalization of the interaction between neighboring sites. It'll be repulsive. Uh, you gain energy by having empty sites next to you. So if I put uh, another doubly occupied site next to this, it costs me some energy. There will be a Tij squared. There'll be an energy denominator V. There'll be something it depends upon the phonon frequencies and so on, but doesn't do anything very interesting. All right, so there's that sort of term. That still leaves me with a classical, a classical uh, bipolaron uh, system. And then, well, just like in the TJ model, there are exchange processes. 
They are processes where I take, say, two electrons from here, and in first order I hop one to there, and in the second order I hop one to there. And so that gives me some effective bipolar on hopping matrix element. And this is also going to be Tij squared, because I had to do two powers of T. And in the intermediate state, I've broken the pair. So that costs me an energy V. But there is a, another factor here that depends on the phonons. Why is that? Well, you can see that what I have to do is not only if I'm going to move my bipolar on from here to there, I don't just have to move the electrons. The electrons aren't the bipolar on. The bipolar on is the electrons plus the polarization cloud. So I have to move the whole polarization cloud here. I was planning to do this calculation, but I'm running out of time. I made too many jokes, I guess. Um, but it's relatively easy to do, and I can explain it to anybody that wants later. This gives us a factor here that looks like some number times V over H bar omega naught. This is basically E to the minus the number of phonon modes that are involved in the bipolar. OK? So that's the structure of perturbation theory. And clearly, if I wanted to, I could go to town and calculate at least to several other orders in perturbation theory. Terms are always going to have the structure of one of these or the other. All right, so what is this? Well, this is this compared to this is down by a factor of t squared over v squared. So if I say t is something like the Fermi energy, then this is of order 1 over lambda squared. So my perturbative corrections to the effective interactions are going to be small so long as Lambda is much bigger than 1. OK? These terms are even smaller, because you notice I can divide this by t and multiply it by t. So this term is e to the minus lambda divided by <coughs> w. So this is not only exponentially small when lambda is big, it's even more exponentially small when we're in the area <coughs> of extreme retardation. OK, so there are two things that we can conclude. First, what I said about the strong coupling limit, yes, there are lovely pairs sitting there. But in the strong coupling limit, they're not useful for <coughs> anything except charge density waves. They're always their kinetic energy is exponentially small compared to anything else in the problem. But secondly, I come with this very surprising conclusion, which is that my strong coupling analysis, this is my last statement, So we get that the migdal ashford theory is valid for W inverse much less than lambda. And we get that our strong coupling polaronic theory is valid for lambda much bigger than 1. But if W inverse is much bigger than 1, then we have a conflict for W inverse much less than lambda, greater than lambda, much greater than 1. Both theories 
claim victory. They're giving us answers that couldn't be more different from each other. And so something is wrong. Okay, good. Right on time. 